I'm the Deputy Director for Fire Management in the Pacific region of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, which is uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and the Pacific Island Group. And I always leave the Pacific Island Group for last because everybody gets this romantic version. And it is cool. We've burned, I've done prescribed burns on Midway Atoll that uh, I don't think you can talk to anybody else in fire management that has done a prescribed burn on Midway Atoll. So there you go. got laid off from the ski area and that sucked you know I worked at the ski area year round doing lift maintenance and ski patrol for I don't know six years and it was a great job you know in the summertime just go do whatever I would do and then ski in the winter so I got laid off and I had to find a job and um, my uh, wife had uh, started working for the Forest Service two years before and she said oh, there's some seasonal jobs over here on the range crew um, in Panguage, Utah that I might be able to put in form so I was I went uh, bike riding for about a month and then ran out of money so I figured I better get a job and so uh, that in 1985 I put in for a GS3 range crew seasonal technician and started uh, I think it was June of, of that year so um, I got to build fence for a summer and um, beautiful country and got on my first fire after we did fire school in in June and uh, I don't know, you can, you can tell people on their first fire, and if you get the opportunity to be on someone with their first fire, um, you, you pay close attention to how they, they react. And usually you have people that either are, this is the best thing ever, or what the heck are they doing there? And um, that first fire that I went on, and uh, <laughs> it was, this is great. I'm you know, a long ways from the road, I'm gonna be camping out, and putting line around this thing, and you know, a bunch of people that are, you know, new to me, but they're friends, and this is a seems like a fun job. So um, that's how I started as a seasonal GS3 on, on the range crew on the Powell District and uh, on the Dixie National Forest. 86, uh, still on the range crew, I ran the engine sometimes, but 87, we had the fires in California, that CJ 87, and by that time, I was a squad boss and on a Type 2 crew, and we would go to California for 30 days or so, and I got to run chainsaw and drop some big ass trees. You know, there's, there are bigger trees there than there are in Utah, and this was even more fun. So we, um, the more I did fire management, the more I wanted to, to be in it. So that, that winter, uh, 87, got the opportunity um, to become the engine foreman uh, on a Type 6 engine starting the next year on the, the Powell Ranger District. Some of the best years that I can remember in my career were still working at the ski area in the wintertime, you know, as 1313, 1313 GS5 with benefits, skiing all the winter, just when you got slushy and mud out there, it was time to go back to the Forest Service and go burn and do spring burn. As, as my career went on, and that just became more and more fun all the time, what I found I really enjoyed about uh, firefighting was the prescribed burning because we used to burn if you never burned aspen before um, especially large patches of aspen there's not many things more rewarding if you got if you like elk and uh, large ungulates and you know that they like the aspen you go rip off a thousand acres and see it the next year and you've got aspen up to your belly and it's just looking healthy you can see how the fire responds and needs disturbance and it's uh, it's at that point that the, the, one of the things that I have uh, anchored my career on to this day is I consider myself a resource manager, and my tool is fire. And with that, you know, I want to be the best I can be at understanding how to use fire to be able to benefit and you know, sustain the resource, whether it's unplanned ignitions and managing them for effect or planned ignitions and using them um, to benefit the resource. That's always anchored me in my career. You know, I, I like the lights and siren and the, you know, the, the tankers running and everything else. That's a lot of fun, but there's a, in my mind, at least in my career, I found a limitation for that. After a long summer of, you know, doing that, it's, okay, this is the same tune just played on a different mountaintop. And, and I know it's going to do the same thing next year on a different mountaintop. And, if probably somebody else is going to get hurt and probably somebody else is going to get killed and and ultimately why are we doing what we're doing with with these systems and, and keep going on that same sort of route so 
primarily I consider myself a resource manager. I fall into being a firefighter sometimes because I, I need to, and yeah, I enjoy that too. But uh, the resource management is, is what keeps me coming back. And when I find myself losing that uh, focus on resource management, I lose my enthusiasm. I start thinking about different jobs. Uh, you know, I'll go fly airlines for a living or something else. Some of the things that got me to realize that I was more of a resource manager is the prescribed burning. And the prescribed burning on a large scale over uh, in the same area that you called home, uh, that you got used to treating it as home and understanding how fire works. I think some of the things that really um, made me realize, uh, set some of my decision um, criteria and where I wanted to end up were some of the larger fires that we've managed. One of them, and uh, probably the biggest mentor early in my career, who just retired, actually, I think, yesterday, well, from Saturday was his last day, Kim Soper. He and I used to take horses and load um, as much fuel, drip torch fuel, and uh, drip torch as we could. We'd head out and trail. We had a burn plant. It wasn't real big, but he would go down the bottom, and I'd stay on the top. He'd get down the drainage further than me, and I'd run off the top and uh, light the, the ridge off, and then we'd ride the horses back to the trailer that night. And we'd come back the next year, and we'd see what we did. And it's just great. I mean, you're managing the systems with the, the tool that how it developed over time. So you can really see how your management effects are mimicking nature, but you're also protecting the resources that you value too, the guard station or the private land. So people like that help frame, uh, make me into the, the, the government employee I am today and what I value as resource management. Now, some of the things that have changed over time, back when I was uh, skiing, in the, in the winter and uh, you know running the engine in the summer are my I, I was pretty idealistic I figured that you know by 2010 we'd be in a system where we'd be managing more fires than we were putting out that we'd have a public that understood that they needed to take care of their private property if they live next to the wildland that we would be killing less people over time because we'd be exposing less people well that idealism has gone and and I'm not quite a cynic yet, but I can see it from here. And um, but I, there was a lot of people that I'm working with here recently, and uh, over my career that still has that idealism that we can manage fire in, in the Western U.S. for resource benefit and do it safely and get the public to take their responsibility for their land. And we make increments sometimes. I see us take two steps forward and four steps back. And it's a great time to watch this evolve over the last 20, 25 years to see how we've made progress in my mind and gone backwards. But um, that idealism has kind of, uh, you know, ebbed and flowed over that time. And maybe that's natural as you get older. My career path was one from the engine foreman. I became a, um, a FMO on a district in Cedar City. And from there, and that was more of out of, you know, I was getting, it became my first full-time job of the Forest Service. From there, I was a Zone A FMO for the, the West Zone of the Dixie. I was the Zone FMO. Then from there, I became the Forest FMO and did that for, for 10 years. But as I, I look on, and as you move up, I always think of it, when I was on the district, I'd have, you know, yearly annual gratification. I'd be able to plan something, implement it, and see it go off. When you go to the, the supervisor's office, it's maybe every couple, three years, you'd be able to plan an organization, get the funding for it, and implement it. Regional office uh, is more like months or, or years, and I see at the Washington office, it's more years. What keeps me kind of thinking about stuff is, and I've just realized this lately, is that some of the folks that uh, I've helped get established in the system and watch, and I was just talking to one before we started this, on how their, their idealism and trying to enable that idealism that I lost 
years ago and trying to find the bureaucracy and the, the pieces of bureaucracy we can move to allow that, that true, that idealism to take hold and watching these other folks take that and move it, the rock just a little bit further and a little bit further, that keeps me messing with the bureaucracy. It, um, and many days it's hard because there's, there's sometimes uh, little, little tangible reward for doing that stuff. And it takes years, and you've got to. Once you get one, you've got to hold on to it. And say, hey, look at this. I, this took me ten years to get here, or five years to get here, and it's it's worth something. Even though you know this week and next week, I won't probably make any sort of actual, you know, new accomplishments. But uh, so the bureaucracy, dealing with it, trying to make it, enabling the the, the folks that. I brought in with the similar ideals to maybe change that whole bureaucracy into something that I was more idealistic about years ago. But um, you know, beyond that, uh, the ASCs, Albuquerques, all the different things that we can complain about in your bureaucracy all the time, they can really eat you up. The happiest people that I've seen at this at the similar point in my career are the ones that are anchoring on the folks on the ground and trying to help them do a better job, and they get rewards. So I'm trying to vector myself that way, too. Ultimately, folks have got to have fun, and they've got to enjoy what they're doing, whether it's uh, finding reward in what they're accomplishing, or just having fun in general uh, where they're they're at. That the the team has to have uh, um, a little bit of fun. If they hate coming to work every day, then the team is not going to be very uh, functioning. And that's common through all the different teams that I've I've worked with. And so um, the, the commonalities are differences. And uh, recognizing that everyone is different, every team is different. And not just thinking that this team is going to be just like the last team and we're going to go about things the same way. And it, it won't work nine times out of ten. It, it's difficult, um, especially to get the perspective to be able to do that with a clear head. But uh, what I try to do is, you know, what is this action going to get me both short term and long term? Is this something that's critical, or is if we don't get it done now, today, and expose them to this level of risk, what happens if we go beyond that, and what are the consequences of that? And if that initial action is, in my mind, worth that risk, that it needs to be done now, the exposure is, you know, X, Y, or Z, and if we don't get it done, and so always taking the, the, the null alternative, if we don't do it, then what might happen? So looking at the risk based on if we don't do it, what will happen? And then uh, looking back on, you know, what is the, the probability for uh, exposure for the folks uh, that are out there? And exposure, you know, there, there are lots of different um, aspects of that that you can look at, you know, tree phones, snacks, uh, rolling rocks, aircraft, um, driving the truck from one fire to another. There's a lot of exposure issues that, you, you you can't get hung up on there. You'll paralyze yourself, but you've got to think about it. If you run a hotshot crew from Division Zulu to Alpha, and it's going to take them eight hours, but you need them over there by the morning, and you run them all night, well, you know, those are value judgments that you have to make on the time. Another good technique that I've found when considering those things is um, talk to somebody that you trust and bounce it off of them. If you're, if you're wondering, even if you're not wondering, it's good to have a reality check every once in a while. Are we doing the right thing here? Um, good confidant, mine, Dave Hart, is, is great for that. It's, you know, just taking yourself, because all of us can get wrapped up into target fixation and we want to accomplish this thing. What's difficult is to pull yourself out and say, well, what are we trying to really accomplish here? And is it worth the risk to putting folks there? So talking to somebody when it's going on and taking that extra couple of minutes to think, well, if I don't do this, is something bad going to happen? And, you know, the, and so using it that way. But it's a very dynamic situation. And it's another one of those things that's a lot of fun. That if you're doing it well, if you're assessing risk well, it becomes, you know, 
you've got the intelligence from the weather is doing and the fuels and things like that, and you're able to, you really do that risk assessment quickly and implement and implement. So, yeah, that's one another one of the fun parts of the job. If there's an exposure of risk and I'm curious about it, I'm sending somebody in or a group of people in, I'll want to get their feedback too and their their read on what's what are they seeing from this same situation. How am I seeing it inappropriately? We have got high fire danger in Hawaii and we've had it pretty much all year. And I talked to one of the local guys out there and I go, you know, am I overreacting? Your indices are off the chart here and you're not getting any fires, but what is the risk? Is it something that I'm seeing inappropriately and you have a better on the ground vision of what that risk is? What, what I think though is that we can also get blinded by uh, thinking, relying too much on what we think of as experts. That sometimes our position as we're considering risk and exposure for putting people in is a lot more objective than the people that are closer to it. And so my uh, perspective might be, oh man, you're not going down in that hole. You're not going down in that hole because we don't care about that hole, number one. And if it gets to this next ridge, we, that's a better place to pick it up. But the folks on that division or in that area are saying, this is our job. You know, we're, we're tasked with doing this. And we think we can mitigate stuff and kind of sneak down and get into that rock pile and drop a few snags and we'll be fine. And they'll be mission oriented. So deferring to the folks on the ground for their risk assessment that trumps yours is not always a good technique either. So you've got to have that balance of really, you know, weighing both of them before you, you go one way. What I hate to see is when the, the hotshot tubes come in, ah, you know, ops, we got this, no problem. And the ops just kind of says, ah, okay, if you can do it, go do it. And I, I hate to see that because the ops should have the perspective to be able to, you know, influence that or have a better perspective on what the real risks values are for doing that. You can see people with different uh, ideas on what they like about fire management, and some like the lights and siren, and uh, you know, go and listen to the scanner, and you know, respond. And, and you know, again, that's fun, but it isn't what keeps me coming back all the time and putting up with the bureaucracy as much as we do. What keeps me coming back is seeing that aspen that we burned 10, 15 years ago. That's a beautiful stand now, and you can see how it just makes that whole mountain range healthier. It's always good to think back of what's important to you, you know, and, and these types of things are good because I think we go through day to day in the bureaucracy and not really remember what's important to us and why we do the job that we do. And those things help me refocus. So uh, doing this, not only in the formal setting, but informal, you know, in your own head when you're driving to work or you're on an airplane going somewhere, is why am I doing what I'm doing? And, you know, I could do something else if I don't like this. But, you know, the resource management and trying to keep people as safe as possible, that still keeps me coming to work. And, you know, looking back on 25 years, it's been a lot of fun, been a lot of places, and, and had some good things go on. So, yeah.